Welcome back, and we have Victor Thorne back. And Victor, I uh, love having you on the program. I'd like to have you on weekly or bi weekly uh, because you have covered so many topics. You have over 40 books. Your latest is Conspiriality. I love that term, too, which is a com- combination of the science of conspiracy and reality. And the latest is the third edition, third book in the New World Order Assassins. You've written two books about uh, the Abominator. I call it The Abomination That Shall Desolate. Uh, and he's not into his second term of presidency, he's into his first term of dictatorship. And uh, I'm hoping that Benghazi will blow back on him, that the Teflon president will find that Benghazi has been coated with super glue, and neither him nor Hillary Clinton, the Democratic candidate, uh, looks like showing up for 2016, uh, who used Susan Rice as a punching bag uh, to try to avoid the truth about the fact that not only is she incompetent, but evil as hell. So is Obama. In fact, his offhand comment at the uh, inaugu- at the recent uh, press uh, dinner for White House press staff, his offhand joke was uh, that people were saying that he looked like uh, Satan in the Bible series, in miniseries on television. He said, that's an insult to Satan. And I think he was serious. So um, Obama is liquid evil. And he is a Fuhrer in the waiting, waiting just for disaster to strike to use the National Defense Authorization Act that he actually begged for, pretended he wouldn't want to sign it, and signed it immediately. And, of course, his predator drone kills on Tuesdays, I'm sure, are the highlight of his entire week when he can look at the baseball cards of death. Uh, he has literally, as a constitutional and civil rights lawyer, done everything he can to violate every aspect of the Constitution and to accede to power to the NATO and the United Nations, even making more. And the latest, of course, is to now give heavy weapons to the al-Qaeda terrorists that are trying to do regime change and authorizing the Israelis to have the type of weapons to do an air attack on Iran, which will, if it is carried forward, precipitate World War III. So we have a man that needs to be impeached immediately, and he needs to be in a padded room with a posy jacket on, and I don't approve of anti-psychotic psychotic drugs, but he needs to be sedated somehow so he won't cause any more damage to the planet or the rest of the population. He really is out of control. You're speechless. <laughs> no, oh, oh, yeah, um, I, I, I couldn't agree more, Bill. And You're in shock because it, it all made sense. Uh, well, Victor, I want to hear your words on this. So we, let's start off with Benghazi. You, you've been a big uh, an analyst of this. There's so much coming out here. In fact, I got the newspaper today. I was looking at the uh, Union Tribune San Diego. And, of course, they have two major articles on here. The first, of course, is both Mr. Hicks, who uh, literally blasted from every angle uh, like a special forces journalist, uh, the administration, both the State Department and the presidency. And then we have this book out here by former Navy SEAL Brandon Webb, co-authored a book on Benghazi that came out in February. I mean, this is obscenity at the highest level. If this isn't enough, like Watergate, to impeach uh, a Bush, uh, I mean, Obama and the State Department and get people charged and something horrible happened to them, then nothing is going to remove this guy. Yeah, and what it boils down to is, I mean, we can't be naive about this, that the only way Obama or any president takes a fall is if the powers that be want him to take a fall. So the reason Nixon went down was because it was determined that he was going down. The same with John Kennedy. Well, I'll give you a couple of indicators. A couple of indicators I think he is on his way out uh, is although there, people often think it's a monolithic single structure that's the New World Order. It's not. It's competing forces. And some of those major forces uh, wanted the XL pipeline, wanted energy independence in America, wanted the Liberty Rig up in Prudhoe Bay, Alaska. And Obama has done everything he can to, to literally stymie the oil interests uh, and uh, push the green energy agenda. And I think that he's pissed off the wrong globalists. I think that Obama has uh, it believes the delusion that somehow he's president. He realizes he should realize he's an actor in chief. He's a he's a prime puppet. And the fact that he thinks being a communist and a narcissist that he's actually in control of the government, he's going to find out that these competing forces are going to take him out. Yeah, well, um, I, I think it even it's bigger than what you said was that the reason a man is selected as president is that he's in essence a cheerleader. He's the person right. that has to get certain certain programs pushed forward. Um, right. With the whole Sandy Hook thing, Obama was supposed to be the great 
incentivizer who would who would compel America and compel Congress that that we need to limit guns. He failed miserably. And the powers that be, that was one of the big points on their agenda that they wanted for Obama was that he had to push this through. He failed. Um, when it comes to Obamacare, he pushed it through. He was successful on that front. But now, now, now it's being the, defunded. Impl- it's the a, implementation a, of it is such a catastrophic train wreck that I yeah, think well, everyone involved now realizes we have to stop this thing. We, we can't, as much as they want yeah. socialized medicine, it's such an atrocity and so well, out of control that they, I can't see how they let it go forward. Well, in fact, even uh, boosters that supported it and pushed it have basically... Uh, They're bailing out. Uh, bailing out. I mean, we're talking about senators that said this is a train wreck. Uh, so I don't know how they can continue pushing, and Obama continues to not make any public statements, which is going to amplify the blowback on him. A yeah, uh, number of states Bacchus, basically... Max Baucus, one of the designers... He he bailed out. He's resigning now, and he, he called it specifically a train wreck. Jay Rockefeller, another one of the designers, went on record last month and, and criticized it horrendously. Um, the, the lady Kathleen Sebelius in charge of Health and Human Services is saying that, that this is so far out of control, we don't know how to get it back under well, they got, control. Well, they got 20,000. So. 20, well, how about just axing it? How about just stopping it completely? I know what the solution is. It's real simple. Uh, I helped the uh, government panels in, the, in Canada try to set up some uh, modifications to their socialized health care. Because, by the way, Canadian socialized health care, British and Australian, is considered to be better, but it still doesn't work. Because I call it hangnail medicine at the speed of light. If you have something minor, you'll get it treated quickly. But if you want something innovative, forget it. Mm-hmm. Anything new innovative care in terms of cancer care, uh, cardiac uh, bypass, or new innovative surgery for different things, it's not going to happen. And if you have well, a serious health much. problem... Yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Well, yeah. It, it costs too much, and when when it gets down to this point now that instead of insurance companies paying for it, now it's the government paying for it. And if you're you know 75 years old and still in relatively good health, but you need a heart transplant, they do the calculations. They give it to the actuary. They punch in the numbers and say, ah, uh, this 75 year old's usefulness has been exhausted. No heart transplant for them. You might as well go walk into Soylent Green. You know, it's right. So in other out. words, it's basically Seinfeld's a soup kitchen where they say no soup for you today. <laughs> yeah, no heart for you. No heart for you. No chemo, no dialysis. <laughs> you go home, tech to relatives. You go home You're, and die. You, yeah, we, actually, what they should do is they should change it to, in terms of health and human services, we'll call it the Secretariat of Jesus. Because we're not going to provide you care. We're just going to arrange your appointment with Jesus. Yeah, and I mean, when, when, you look at, when you look at how much is owed into the future. I'm not just talking about the deficit. I'm talking about everything that's owed in pensions, in um, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and so forth, these unfunded mandates. We're up into like the hundreds of trillions of dollars. And obviously, when when the U.S. government only collects $2 trillion a year in tax money, um, there's no way that we can meet these obligations. So at some point, either the whole system collapses or they go into a Soylent Green type of mode where they say we can no longer afford to keep paying old people money. So you know, well, people just go elsewhere. Other. I mean, if you want a kidney transplant, you go to Mexico, you go to Europe, you go to Brazil. If well, you need to have surgery, Social Security, you don't have the money to go to Mexico or Brazil. I know that, but so what it means is that you die. To, people exactly. So what it basically means is is a tiered system that kills people. Right. Um, and we see that, by the way, with delays even in surgery for hips in Canada. I mean, if you have connections, you can get into a surgery center, and you can get the surgery now instead of 24 months from now. If you have a broken hip and you develop a bed sore or muscle atrophy, you may never get out of your bed again or get on, uh, you know, into a walker. So, um, yeah, when we come back, we'll talk about it. I mean, he has the anti-Midas touch. Everything that Obama and his administration touches turns to crap. Everything. Amazing. Back in a moment. Forty percent or so. They're gonna they're gonna resist no matter what, even if the facts smack them in the head. <laughs> Welcome back, and now we're gonna get into Benghazi. And, and of course, the Benghazi thing is is blowing up right in the face. In fact, I'm gonna just tell you the headlines of the Drudge Report here. 
Um, Senator, the dam is about to break on Benghazi. Report special ops held back. And there's four special ops. They actually apologized to Hicks, the uh, State Department uh, in person in Libya. Uh, White House tries to deflect. State Department won't voucher for credibility of officials set to testify. That's tomorrow. These people are sticking their necks on the line because they know they're going to be persecuted, they're going to be threatened, their jobs and their future pensions, etc., will be threatened. They're American patriots like this guy Hicks standing up against a president that's clearly a criminal. The State Department, Hillary Clinton, I call her Hitlery Rotten Clinton, her maiden name being Rodham. Uh, we've got some real problems on our hands here. And, of course, the uh, uh, real issue right now is why did they hold back? It's because they're tying up loose ends because Benghazi was a transshipment point for advanced weapons being sent to do regime change. And uh, they've been doing this for some time, and they decided that probably uh, the ambassador was not completely going along with the program, so they decided we might as well tie up loose ends and kill them, which is what they did. Uh, they held back. Uh, troops that could have been in there, they stopped uh, even an air um, strike that might have been brought in a jet within a matter of hours, so the second attack wouldn't have stopped. Uh, tell us your analysis of the Benghazi thing, because this is really going to blow up tomorrow with uh, Representative Isu, who I'm very proud of. He's a representative here from Vista, California. And uh, I think that they're going for the jugular, and I hope they don't just get Hillary. They need to get Obama. Obama and the lying chief... Uh, uh, I call it the abomination, needs to be removed like a tumor from our body politic. Well, I'm still not convinced that they're going to go for the jugular. I'm, I'm hopeful. Neither am I, but I, I'm hoping. I'm going to hope and pray. I'm going to get down, on, not on my knees, but on my face on the ground, crying out to the Most High God, for God's sake, let's get rid of this guy before he starts World War III. Yeah, um, yeah like I was saying, um, it, it's it's still left to be seen. It's what is the what's happening behind the scenes. What's the the script that they'll be reading from? If they go after this guy, um, or if they allow the whistleblowers and they ask the right questions tomorrow, if they lob all the the right bombs, we know then that something something some kind of shift is in the wind. But I'm still yeah. not convinced of that because you know if you look at Fast and Fur- Furious and even the earlier Benghazi. Um, um, hearings. If you look at, at Mitt Romney in the last debate, none of these guys went for the throat whatsoever. So he, he was like one of the fighters, you know, as if uh, you know the uh, the prize fighters decided was told to throw the fight. Yeah, yeah, that's so. You know, I'm not I'm not convinced of anything yet until I see what happens tomorrow. But a, a positive sign is that you know Benghazi happened seven and a half months ago. The mainstream media has paid very, very little attention to it up until the last few days when these whistleblowers you know, were, were called to testify up on Capitol Hill. So right now the Washington Post, New York Times, all of them are running articles, and it's because they have no choice in the matter. And um, will this become something like Watergate? That's left to be seen. But if you look at Watergate, nobody died there. Four people died down here. And the most yeah, exactly. egregious thing that happened was that these whistleblowers, especially Gregory Hicks, is saying yeah. that, that, that the C-130, the men were inside the plane, ready to take off to go save the, the men before the second assault and, happened and, on them. They could have saved these guys' life. They were told to stand down. So right. And he actually, the, the head of the Special these Forces... These are our countrymen. These are Americans that were yeah. told by either the Pentagon or the State Department or directly from the White House, let them die because they were told to stand down. They didn't intervene. They didn't go in and rescue them. And to me, that's a, whether you're Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Independent, anything, you don't let Americans die. No, like no, that. you don't. This is not American. Let me read the uh, paragraph from this UC uh, San Diego report. When it was all over and the jets had not been scrambled and the troops not dispatched, an American lieutenant colonel in Tripoli who commanded the four-man special ops team told Hicks he was sorry his men had been held back, specifically by the State Department and this presidency. I've never been, by the way, we know what Obama did at that night during the middle of the crisis. He went to bed. Uh, and didn't ask for anybody to wake him up about if anything changed. Well, and the next uh, day I, he went, he flew out to Las Vegas and went to a campaign rally. Right, and I think he met That's with uh, Beyonce. About the I, I think he also met with uh, Beyonce and her husband, too. Um, I've never been, and this is a quote, I've never been so embarrassed in my life that a State Department officer has bigger balls than someone in the military, the officer told Hicks. According to the diplomat's account, Hicks called that a, quote, nice compliment. 
Uh, this is crazy. The account started to reignite a debate over whether the Obama administration had been sufficiently forthcoming in its public accounting of the events and missteps that resulted in the first death of the U.S. ambassador in the line of duty in a generation. Plus other people are contract uh, people. In fact, they held off 300 people. It's almost like the Battle of 300, only in reverse. They held off 300 al-Qaeda terrorists. And what I was told is that, uh, from my sources, is that these terrorists were actually told in there to remove and to kill these guys. And uh, the, the story that I'd heard is that they were originally going to uh, kidnap this guy and hold him for ransom, dealing with some kind of deal that, that tied in with some kind of blind shake that was going through some kind of trial. And what happened is when they when he, uh, they they hauled him out of there, apparently these Al Qaeda terrorists supposedly, and they he was dying from smoke inhalation from what they'd done when they firebombed the place because he was in the secure room, uh, and then they, the the terrorists brought him to an emergency department to try to prevent him from dying because they didn't have him to then exchange. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of anomalies here that when this comes out, it's going to go back to these al-Qaeda terrorists were sent because, you know, the head of al-Qaeda terrorism is Obama. He, he's the head of the organization, you know, and the CIA. And they control the CIA, the elders, al-Qaeda, and all these guys, and it's obvious when they're now going to give them heavy weapons that Obama and these guys have a lot tighter relationship because if you're just going to kill the guy, why did they bring him to the emergency department dying of smoke inhalation because he died in the ER? Yeah, it's um, it's it's so egregious what happened down there, and yeah, you know, when we when we look then at the at the talking points, how they came out four days later, went on all the the Sunday talk shows, and completely laid a, a smoke screen on the American public that this is outright deception, and we know that the the State Department colluded with the White House, so this means Hillary Clinton and, and Barack Obama, and if and you were right, Bill, when you said that, that this consulate down at the CIA embassy was used as as a, a, a point to transfer the weapons that were seized after Gaddafi fell, and they were shipping them into Turkey down to, to Syria, to the rebels who are fighting against Assad, and we know that Hillary Clinton has lots of experience running guns like this because she was involved in the whole Iran Contra thing at MENA, where they were manufacturing guns. And when the planes came to dump the cocaine, they would load them back up with guns to take them down to the quote unquote freedom fighters down there. Yeah, yeah, me in Arkansas. So, you're talking about you know, this yeah, is so nothing but a repeat of Iran Contra. Exactly. And I think when it comes back, it's going, to, it's going to blow all the way back and that these uh, credit terrorists didn't do this as a so-called reaction, like this idiot Susan Rice said, to go to a, a protest against this stupid movie. Oh, no, this was a planned terrorist activity that was controlled, and they were told, you know, almost like in the mafia, rub that guy out. And I believe the orders came from the inside of the rogue elements in the CIA to take the ambassador out and anybody else that was still left at the, at the facility. And it was a nearby prison area where they had weapons and people that could have stopped this and they didn't let them activate them. Welcome back. So, we oversee the uh, chicanery of Obama's administration. They not only did regime change in Libya and Tunisia, they all, not only did li regime change in, in Egypt, which is basically putting in high-level masons, the Muslim Brotherhood, 1928, founded in London, England, that are in a dark alliance with the global banker elite. Uh, but we now have Obama pushing the buttons that are actually moving us toward a Mideast nuclear war, which will release Iranian and Syrian Russian biopreparate uh, third world war, advanced biological weapons developed over 80 years in Russia, where all those scientists went were starving to death after glasnost and perestroika. We have a situation where Bashar Assad is begging the West and doing interviews to not to, re to, to not deal with Al Qaeda, uh, and yet we're trying to say to to Bashar Assad after they hit twice and it kills 42 soldiers, hits a chicken farm, hits a, uh, a chemical site, etc., where Bashar Assad has no intentions of using weapons. We know that the chemical weapons used were ones captured by the so-called Al-Qaeda terrorists. What Israel needs to be worried about is if Bashar Assad falls, you can damn well be certain that they're going to use these weapons against Israel, and the only option Israel will have is to nuke a good chunk of Syria. And that will unleash uh, Russia and China to come down with 
millions of troops and advanced Russian weapons. And by the way, the best physicists on Earth are Russian. And their weapon systems are designed to basically take all the chinks and weaknesses in our armor and our military and our strategic defenses and take us down to Chinatown. So if we think we're going to win a war against Russia and China, think again, America will cease to exist. Now, they'll cease to exist, too, but we're going to cease to exist. It's going to be a pyrrhic victory. Uh, the people that are hiding in their underground bunkers a few miles down will come up, and the earth will be a burnt cinder, not habitable for hundreds or thousands of years. That's where we're headed. And this moron Obama is pushing for war that will end humanity and most life forms on this earth. That's what this idiot is doing. Pretty bad, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Bill, this is um, yeah, this is Victor Thorne, anyone out there that doesn't know. Um, I don't yeah. know if you even know who the guest is today, but it's Victor Thorne. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah, you can yeah. go to wingtv.net and check out any of my books there. But Yeah, uh, I want you yeah. to give us your analysis, because the latest, of course, is this. Even Putin's keeping Kerry waiting for hours. Give us your analysis of Benghazi and the whole situation and Obama's administration and all of these things. I'm going to stand back and let you roll for this next segment and, and give us your information on it. Yeah, well, I guess with, with Syria right now that this is... There's been such a slaughter over there of seventy to eighty thousand people already. Um, in the last week, Israel has led these assaults. Now that this is obviously they've stepped across what Obama calls the the red line, whatever that means. And you know, some people are saying that Assad is using the chemical weapons now. The administration been- is coming out and saying the rebel, rebels are using the chemical weapons. Nobody knows what's going on over there. It's anarchy. It's so out of control that nobody has any idea what's happening. And, you know, when we, when the United States and NATO attacked um, Libya, it was nowhere near, nowhere near in, in such dire straits as Syria is. Yet we've let this atrocity go on for two years over there. And now Israel's getting into it that, you know, one day we're going to wake up and it's going to be full-fledged war over there, and then there's no turning back. Well, most of the, you know, nine out of ten of the so-called Assyrian Free Army are, are foreign um, mercenaries or people released from prison or terrorists that were, you know, mass murderers from Tunisia and uh, and and, uh, and uh, Libya and from, you know, so the situation is over the top. And the fact that we're now going to give heavy arms, and the next thing I would expect NATO to do is to try to do an, an air campaign where they set a no-fly zone. Russia basically won't put up with it. They're going to put up a system there that will mean if we fly our jets over there, we're going to lose pilots and planes. We're going to start losing missiles. We're going to start losing hardware. And if they start a shooting war against our Navy, we're going to see carrier groups go to the bottom of the uh, Persian Gulf. Yeah, well, John, Secretary of State John Kerry is over there in Russia today. He met with Putin. So right now, they're deciding what's going to happen. Um, you know, they're, they're putting the chips on the table and seeing who's going to blink first. So, you know, I don't know if any of us know for certain what's going to transpire here. But yeah. when we're moving this close to the, the, the most volatile region in the world, which is the Middle East, and you have Israel, you know, the, the greatest terrorist nation on earth, doing these things, well, what happens is it leads to war. And so right. Kerry, yeah. John Kerry and Putin now are, are, are bartering back and forth and deciding what they're going to do, where they stand. Of course, China always plays a role. And, right. um, you know, we have a president who's not only never had a job in the real world, who's never had any executive experience, who's never had any military experience. And this is the man we feel comfortable with leading our nation into, into these precarious times. I, I just, if, any, if everybody out there isn't scared to hell by, by this scenario, they should be because we have the most inept president in recent memory and maybe in history in this country as our commander-in-chief. How can that be? Well, I think that uh, here's a scenario. Uh, I give you use a joke for this. Uh, do you know why they invented, why God allowed uh, the Scots to invent single malt liquor, uh-huh. so the Scots wouldn't rule the world, and why uh, the, God allowed the Russians to invent vodka, or at least the Scandinavian peoples of the Russians? It's so Russian. Now, the fact is, Mr. Putin doesn't touch a drop of vodka. 
He's smart, he's tough, and he's going to kick ass. And if they think that they're going to be able to push the Russians out of Tartus, and the Russian-Chinese alliance, who now gets 90% plus of the oil from northern Iraq, ain't going to happen. In fact, it says it right in the Bible that once these uh, things really get rocking and rolling in the future, China will actually bring over the Khyber Pass, which they built the superhighways, and finish them in 1989 with Iran. They'll bring their weapons and systems right through Iran into the Middle East, and uh, the Turks can literally shut off their dam systems and literally dry up the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in a matter of a couple of days. So, in other words, it's right out of the Bible. We're, we're looking at something that's right out of the Bible, and if, they, if Israel thinks it can start a war that it can finish, it lost the war in 2006 with Lebanon. Tell me what you think of that, because they had uh, anti-tank weapons, they had anti-helicopter weapons. Hezbollah now is having these Iranian events, 110 uh, rockets that can go hundreds of miles and is accurately targetable. I think that, that uh, as Barry Chalmers says, Israel is toast. And the only thing that will save Israel, at least temporarily, is going to be the covenant with death of Isaiah that basically means they're going to partition the city and the state, which Obama has promised the Palestinians back in January. He will partition Israel and the city of Jerusalem in order to bring peace. And the Israelis, by the way, have agreed last week to the Arab League's uh, recommendation of a land for peace deal, it's the first time in history that the uh, Arabs agreed to a non-1967 border uh, boundary system, which means that all with all of this uh, shaky, rattle, you know, saber rattling and destruction going on, and the the fear of literally a World War III starting, we're moving very quickly toward a peace treaty. That's going to be scary. It's going to be literally, I call the detonator for World War III is being built. Yeah, well, it's it's um, we'll know here, we'll know here shortly, I believe. So. Well, if Obama's not removed, then basically the peace treaty is going to happen probably the next year to two years. It, yeah. it can't go on much longer. It can't because we're getting closer and closer to this war expanding us now in Lebanon. Pretty soon it'll be it'll be spreading to other surrounding nations. I mean, the King of Jordan is freaked out because he thinks the war with Syria is going to expand across the Jordan. So they have American and British training. Al Qaeda terrorists in Jordan to attack Syria. This is not going to be go well. It's not. Yeah, no, it's 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 not. And you know, again, it it all goes back to where do we stand? Why are we? Where where are our allegiances over there? And why why are we allowing our nation? To go downhill so quickly with this, this well, another trillion dollar war. This incompetent person. Right. In the well, White another multi trillion dollar war and the closure of the Strait of Hormuz, one third of the oil cut off of the entire planet, and worldwide de depression immediately if this happens. Millions yeah, dead. We're looking at spread, spreading biological weapons, plagues, and a nuclear war, at least in the Middle East. Unbelievable. So, Victor, let's let's talk about your new latest books, Conspiriality, and the New World Order Assassins. Uh, what's the core of these uh, remarkable books? Now that we've kind of dissected some of the horrors of Obama and Benghazi, uh, tell us all about how did you get the books at WingTV.net. And the, and the core of these two amazing books. Yeah, um, yeah, WingTV.net is where they're found, and they're they're mm-hmm. they're really a continuation of this this quest, I guess, I've had to to put all of these conspiracies in between the covers of of these books. So over the last ten or twelve years or so, you know, between thirty some books that I have almost all of them now, every major conspiracy and. Um, Conspiriality tied up a, a few of the, the last loose ends, so to speak, and New World Order Assassins looked at the biggest hits that happened, um, high profile, anything from Princess Diana to the Port Arthur Massacre to John Lennon and Charles Manson and on and on and on. So it's all good, juicy stuff, and, um, you know, taking it 
the steps below where most um, conspiracy research goes. And then the last thing is that they're all weaved together. You see this thread that connects one to the other, and you realize that none of this stuff happens in a vacuum, that um, there is a concerted effort by these various various tentacles of the octopus that, um, you know, they work together as criminals, and if somebody challenges their power, um, they're taken care of. So that's the, you know, the real gist of these these latest two books. And then I have a final one that just went online today. I just got it yesterday. It's called Machine Elves, Cosmic Serpents, and Quantum Magic that gets into quantum theory and the conspiracies of quote-unquote reality, which is, it, it's further down the rabbit hole than any book I've ever written in my life. Tell but me it, about it, that. That sounds really interesting. So re- review that title again so I can, because you said that you almost talk as fast as Deagle. Oh, yeah, it's called Machine Elves, Cosmic Serpents, and Quantum Magic, and that's magic with a K. Um, and well, it, what's, it, your, what, what's the thesis? Because uh, we know that uh, we're going to bring on some experts on what we call quantum consciousness and uh, you know, basically the hyperdimensional reality of mm-hmm. what we are and what the universe is. Which, yeah. by the way, these Defense Intelligence Agency, DARPA, CIA, etc., they know. That's when we look at things like uh, remote viewing. We know about psychotronic warfare, the lighter machine the Russians developed. These things are real. They're not imaginary, and they are, in a sense, the using advanced technology, which is, in a sense, the uh, the psychotronics of wizardry of the 21st century. There really is a, another level of reality that people don't believe exists, but it does. The power of intention, the power of connectedness, the non-locality of consciousness, uh, which is why near-death experiences are so important for people to understand and have a change of perspective of what the universe is. Yeah. Well, from one of the main theses of this book, and then the one that it was um, the preceded it called Reality Bomb, is that there is no such thing as reality. Re- reality is subjective. It's always in quotation marks. And when you go to quantum theory, basically, there, at, the, at the very basics of everything is we have a wave function and a particle function. Right. And the particle, particle function is the actual physical world that we see, but when molecules finally reach a point of what's called equilibrium, which means death, they make a departure and they go back into the wave function or into the energy pool, so to speak, and then they reformulate, reconnect again with other molecules and so forth and then they form again another particle function. So if, if, if you look at the world around us, when they say that the world is an illusion or existence is an illusion, it truly is because everything is a wave. What happened is, as our brains evolved over many, many millennia, that it, it had to evolve in such a way as that, that it could interpret these waves and make it into something that the brain can comprehend, like a door or a tree or a dog or a car or whatever. But in actuality, everything is just a wave function. That's, that's what existence is. And you know, when, it, when it comes to machine elves and cosmic serpents in that title, you, it gets down to this drug called DMT, which is really could possibly be the source for near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, even UFO encounters, um, um, anything like that. And the cosmic serpent part goes back to a drug called ayahuasca, which has the same ingredient, yeah. ingredients in it as DMT. And our brains possess this DMT in the pineal gland, and right. at night... Um, you know, when we have dreams, or even more so lucid dreams, is you have small amounts of this DMT being released from the pineal gland, and that's what causes these really bizarre psychedelic dreams that we have. So this book goes into all of that. It looks at magic and pranksterism, and it's it's the wildest, wildest ride um, well, it, it, I've ever it, it also, about. It's also explains a lot of the behavior and the, uh, quote, the, if you want the code of ethics and behavior of the globalists, I call them the people of clay and iron. Uh, what people need to start understanding is that our ancient world was invaded uh, through every single culture on earth by transdimensional. I, instead of calling them UFOs, I call them transdimensional beings. They haven't, they're not unidentified and they're not from another place. They've always been here. Just like we talked about in, the, in Saudi Arabia, they used to call them the jinn. Uh, there's these yeah. higher order beings, both positive and negative, that are in the universe. Uh, you might refer to them as angels or demons or whatever you want to call them. Uh, the fact is that we have a highly populated universe. 
uh, and that human beings have basically been uh, subjected to some pretty darn serious interference for a long time. Yeah. Well, it's and, a highly uh, populated multiverses that there's, there's right. many, many, many multiple verses. And exactly. There's, yeah. there's multiple dimensions. So what we have, right. what everyone in society basically agrees upon is what is called consensus reality. Mm. Exactly, and it is yeah. Basically, uh, it's a, it, it's a, a, an agreement, a social agreement that this is the reality that we all function in on a day to day basis. Yeah. But, yeah. At any time, we can leave this dimension and go to other dimensions, you know. And there's a, yep. you know, either through self hypnosis or drugs or lucid dreaming or um, meditation but, or but, other, you know, forms of, of magic that you can go to these other dimensions and find beings out there, denizens or entities, whatever people call them. Yeah. And that's where machine elves comes from is that there's, you know, people that have used DMT, and I've never used that drug, but they say that they encounter these, these magical machine elf beings that are so mind blowing. That there's not even words to describe them. So, you yeah. know, most of the time, human beings, that includes all of us, that we, we limit ourselves. So we stay in this consensus reality and, and accept this social conditioning or programming from the, the, the powers that be, and they won't allow us. It's almost like a self-imposed prison that people don't want to go out and find these other dimensions. But... There's a lot of other stuff going well, on, Bill. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'll give, give an example. When the media, I call it the medium, is trying to, to massage the public to believe a specific thing, they realize that the reality degenerator is the, is the global consciousness of all the human beings on Earth moving the timeline toward a specific consensus reality. So, in other words, they tell us what reality is to become, and they try to create the timeline. Uh, and so when we, when we look at the global over elite, they don't read the newspaper. They make the newspaper. Yeah, they actually oh, exactly, steer yeah. the reality of the, of the global population. That's why, you know, when, when Jesus came, he said, you know, he was the incarnation of the Father in the flesh. He said, you are exactly the same qualitatively as me, and even greater things in the name of the Father you'll do. In other words, you literally, through your intention, uh, once you're connected to the source of all that is, uh, you're connected to what I call, I like to use the term, we am. In other words, although we may be separate in terms of our consensus reality of who we are as a person, we're also connected. Uh, when I do a, a what I call an intervention where I'm actually uh, you know doing a consult with somebody and I'm giving them some taking their medical history and their wellness history I'm actually uh, a what we call a medical intuitive basically I've got a gift that I got 32 years ago and uh, the, the the wall between I and we disappears and so I can literally give a specific, if you want to call it diagnosis, I can tell them, you know, you've got X, Y, Z, and this is what the blood test will show, and this is where the x-ray will show this and that. Uh, and it's because the non-locality of reality and the fact that literally we get to, when we open up the walls, we get to see and know things that give us a glimpse of omniscience. Uh, and human beings are limited because once human beings start to get connected, we will stop doing war, we'll stop doing pestilence, we'll start reconnecting because ultimately what Jesus says, the kingdom comes when we reconnect to the Father and to each other and we start to adhere to things like the golden rule. And because we have a limited view of reality, we uh, are constantly just trying to service and serve ourselves in this very contracted, consensual reality that makes us evil. Evil is disconnectedness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for having me. We need to get you back and talk about that. You're an amazing guy, uh, Victor. Uh, again, the main books are Conspiriality, New World Order Assassins, and the third book, I want you to repeat the title, at wingtv.net is? It's Machine Elves, Cosmic Serpents, and Quantum Magic. Amazing. You're a brilliant author. We'll have you back on soon. Coming up tomorrow, Harley Schlanger and Professor uh, James McCanny will be back on.